So you can just turn around. Anybody can do all of a sudden make the same bowl and make it different just by being right-handed. So and um, anyway, I'm, I'm supporting those points. I'm coming back and I'm emphasizing what I've done in the rim. One of the things you'll find in looking at these uh, is that actually I've done very little to change the form down here. I've done a lot to change the rim. And it implies um, a lot more um, what, alteration of the form than really exists, I guess is the best way of putting it. Anyway, all of this right now for me is like part of a very slow evolution. It took me forever. I, I don't want to think that I'm really uptight about how I manipulate clay, but uh, it took me a long time <coughs> to you know, convince myself I could actually do these things. So The other thing that I want to talk about a little bit is the fact that an awful lot of pots, a lot of my pots, even though I do make a lot of large pots, a lot of my pots are made out of less than two pounds of clay. Surprisingly large number. Uh, I'm, I'm going to finish off hopefully the, this, <coughs> this session by constructing a teapot. And that teapot was made in a bunch of parts and, and I'm going to talk about it. but. <coughs> I also have made quite a few pieces. Uh, for instance, up, I have that bottle form over there. I'm, I always struggle with that shoulder element. Everybody tries to make, make that piece work in one, one piece, and all of a sudden, if you really focus on the fact that you should just work on the curve and not worry about the neck, um, you'll get the curve to the form that you want, and you can add the neck, neck later. So I'm going to throw just a round bottle form, no neck, and then I'm going to add the neck to one that I brought in. And what I'm doing right now is what I do to every piece of clay, by the way. I need my clay. I gave up my pug mill uh, because I felt like I was missing something in my connection with my clay and throwing. Um, and uh, what's her name? Swank. Bought it. Oh, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Karen's right. Yeah. But I gave it up because I did want to reconnect with the clay. And one of the things I always have felt is that if you need your clay and give the time to prep prepping your clay by hand, it's going to tell you what you're going to accomplish with that piece of clay. And so uh, I do that and then I need every piece of clay after I cut it and weighed it. But if you notice, I, I, in this case I needed it on the wheel head. Oftentimes I will need it in my hand. I'll always end up with something that's almost already in a conical form. Um, is this your own clay mix or is this a... Yes. And that's not to say that it's any better or any worse than any other clay. Some people who use used it go, why do you like that stuff? <laughs> um, it's the clay that I've used and I understand it. I know what I'm going to get from it. Um, it has its little um, shortcomings, um, but I understand what they are. It has, for me, certain strengths. And I think one of the things that uh, happens in, with students when they're trying to develop their skills is they sit there and jump around from one clay to the other, thinking somehow the clay is going to change what's going on and what they really probably should do is just accept one clay, 
regardless of its quality, and learn how to work with it, and um, and teach your hands the skills necessary to make it work. What fireside is in your playbox? Hawthorne Bond. Hawthorne Bond. We're I'm teaching in advance. We're developing on the playbox. And this, this clay has a very, very long history, and my clay making started off in, with sharing a studio with Pat Horsley, and we, we made the same clay, and we made all of our clay in a 55-gallon drum. First we made it with a canoe paddle. <laughs> and then we advanced to a piece of plunging equipment. Um, it started off as a metal drum until we started getting iron spots larger than a quarter. <laughs> and, uh, and then we moved to a scrum whiskey barrel that, that then we had to go to Fred Myers all the time and buy Lysol because we were creating new life forms in it. Uh, <laughs> but from that time on, I started blending the clay that I was making with some of the clay made by Bennett Welsh. And he eventually had a, had a clay problem with that clay, and I helped him solve that clay problem. So if you went to clay art, there would be a clay called B. Welsh that you could buy. If you go to clay art, there's a clay, it's called Sprague, that you can buy. Uh, that's not this, by the way. Um, and they're just slightly off of each other. And so then I made an alteration to, to the clay again, and I went to Clay Art and said I wanted to change my clay body, and they said I couldn't have my name. So, uh, <laughs> I had to come up with a name, I'm standing there kind of dumbfounded at the counter. And when my youngest son was really small, I used to decorate all of his lunch bags because I always made his lunch for him. And, and um, his name's Corey, and I made him Yurok, and it was Y-E-R-O-C. And he was Yurok the Magnificent, Yurok the Great. And I always did it in, you know, three and four colors, and I spent I don't know, this, this is where that six, you know, six years of architectural education comes in. <laughs> anyway, so I couldn't think, and so I was standing there, and I said, well, call it your rock. And they kind of looked at me, and they said, okay, and so it was your rock for a while. And now, then I started blending it with a formula that Georgie's makes called Cook, Cook's Pride. And uh, so now my clay body, which is, you can get at clay art, um, is your pride. So it's Y-E-R-P-R-I-D-E. -E. And that's a long, you know, 30 year history of clay making that, that ends up being left in that, that title. So I've lost my focus. So I'm talking too much. Anyway. So I'm making this form, and I get to concentrate on making the sphere because I'm not worried about the neck. And this is where I do go really left-handed. I mean, I'm working on the wrong side of the pot. Um, anybody who's teaching anybody how to throw is going to tell you not to work with your hands on this side of the pot. Is that true? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I say 99.9% .9 of the time, you don't want to do anything on that side. Yeah. And I do an awful lot of stuff on this side of the pot. And you're not seeing it. You're, you're working this way with clay passing through your fingers. I'm working here, and more often than not, the clay is passing through my fingers this way. My fingers aren't like this, they're bent backwards. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. Okay. <laughs>
for the work that you do, do you prefer your clay to be very soft, it seems? Looks I, that goes back to the conversation about prepping your clay and knowing your own skills and knowing that if the clay is on the soft side, you're not going to be making certain forms with that clay. Uh, if I've got to open this up just a touch. If the, uh, the clay is, uh, is uh, you know, firm enough, then you may, may be able to accomplish uh, a whole other range of forms. And I think that's one of the one of the real benefits for me and one of the reasons why I gave up the pub mill was that I really felt I needed to be, I hate using the expression one, but it's one with the clay. Uh, <laughs> you really need to know what it is you're going to be making. And if you just assume that you're going to grab a bunch of clay and all of a sudden start start throwing uh, a pitcher form, for instance, which, 